the thing I'm most proud of in this graphic novel is that it's all has, you know, what we would call verisimilitude. The whole book is is real. I'm not saying it's it's factual. It's all necessarily factually historical, but there's nothing supernatural that happens in this book. What I'm doing is exploring magic as something real rather than something, you know, weird and super dimensional, you know, that it is a matter of will and convincing people and mind over matter. It's not a matter of levitation or, you know, bringing ghosts and spirits into the this realm or, or seeing strange things. It's a matter of actually um, getting the results you want in this reality. Yo, you are listening to O-Culture, transmitting conversations on esoteric art, science, and history at 528 hertz. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. What is up? I'll tell you what's up. We've got a great conversation with media theorist and documentarian Douglas Rushkoff coming up in just a moment. Douglas and I are going to be talking a bit about his new graphic novel, Alistair and Adolf, as well as some other topics in his wheelhouse, including media and propaganda, and how this new book of his is fitting for the times we live in. But first, you're listening to the song Frequencies by my man VHS Dreams. Pop open those show notes and stream it for free right now on SoundCloud. And while you have those show notes open, check out O'Culture on your social media network of choice. Or don't. I won't be offended. I'm not a fan of social media. It's one of those things you have to do to promote shit these days. But we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, Pinterest, Snapchat, sort of. Anyway, let's get this show on the road. Douglas Rushkoff is in the house. He's a writer, documentarian, and lecturer whose work focuses on human autonomy in a digital age. He is the author of 15 best-selling books on media, technology, and society, including Program or Be Programmed, Present Shock, and Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus. He has made award-winning PBS frontline documentaries such as Generation Like, Merchants of Cool, and The Persuaders, and he is the author of graphic novels including Testament for DC Comics and the aforementioned Alistair and Adolf, recently released by Dark Horse Comics. Rushkoff also serves as professor of media theory and digital economics at the City University of New York's Queens College, where he recently founded the Laboratory for Digital Humanism and hosts its Team Human podcast. Douglas has done a bunch of other shit, too, but he's here mostly to talk about Alistair and Adolf. This is a graphic novel set during World War II that views real-world history through a psychedelic occult lens. On the surface, this is a story about Aleister Crowley waging magical warfare on behalf of the Allied forces against Adolf, Hitler, and the Nazis. This was a war of symbols, ideas, and propaganda, and it may be more pertinent now than it was then. Of course, when you have a guy like Douglas in the house, you have so many things you want to talk about. He's such a knowledgeable dude. And there's a lot more packed into this conversation than just Alistair and Adolf. Although we were short on time and did have some Skype issues, so I had quite a few questions that were left unasked. Regardless, I had a blast talking to him, and I hope you have a blast listening to it. So here it is, my conversation with Douglas Rushkoff. Enjoy! Hey, Douglas Rushkoff, what's going on, man? Nothing, just living the life. Aren't we all? Aren't we all? Thanks for being on the show. It really means a lot to me for you to take some time here. Sure. It's uh, I know time's gotten crazy these days for everybody, I think. Yeah, let's talk about that just for a second. You know, I, we're talking two days after Donald Trump was officially sworn in as president of the United States. And, you know, that kind of caps off what was a very unique election cycle and somehow, I think that this graphic novel you've written, it seems very appropriate for the times that we're living in. To borrow a, a word with magical context behind it, did you intend for this book to come out at this time? No, I mean, I wrote it maybe, 
Oh gosh, it must have been like four years ago at this point. And I, you know, thought it up probably eight years ago. You know, I originally pitched it to uh, Vertigo and then uh, did other stuff for them and ended up doing this with Dark Horse. But yeah, it ended, it ended up coming out at, I don't know if you'd call it an opportune time, but a, a synchronistic time. I mean, if anything, I was really more interested for the way that the uh, the tools of fascism and sort of the magical tools of fascism ended up migrating over into advertising and media and culture. And what the... I guess the philosophers before me, you know, the the famous Frankfurt group, guys like Adorno and Benjamin and all, what they were more worried about was, uh, I think, culture slipping over into politics. You know, so, you know, this is a this is a comic that really looks at, uh, you know, how the the work of Crowley and Hitler and and other people using uh, uh, magic during World War II ended up informing the American public relations and advertising industries. But what Trumpism, if you will, is really about, and the the people that were concerned about that were more concerned about the way that the values of popular culture and a popular culture-driven media would migrate really from there into the way that we govern and that we would end up with with fascism as a result. And I think that that's, that's a, a smart way of looking at what happened that, you know, we had, you know, we had reality TV, which we knew wasn't real, but then somehow it was like American idol and these uh, home voting shows that really equated our roles as voting citizens with those of uh consumers who make you know choice by what you buy and i think that that our electorate now looks at voting as some form of self expression and even even cool progressive people you know you don't want to vote for hillary at that point cuz she's just like yeah it's it's just too much the mainstream brand you know you don't want to buy nike you want to buy vans or you know simple or something (laughs) just a little off so i I feel like in in some ways even for progressives even for those of us who should know better we stopped understanding our roles as citizens and our our votes as tools and started to look at them more as you know expressions of personal will which is a dangerous place to go with a crude tool like uh, electoral politics Absolutely. And not to belabor this point or talk too much about it, but you had a good observation shortly after the election on an episode of Team Human where you were talking about the left had essentially, I don't know if they would had become complacent or they just kind of dropped the ball maybe that like you had said that you were personally invited to a fundraiser and it was like all about getting pictures with Chelsea for all this money. And is that really what was going to win you over? I know it was sort of sad. I mean, what what I I got an invite, an email invite to uh, you know, oh, you spend like five hundred dollars and you get to be in the same room with Chelsea Clinton, and you spend like a thousand and you get a photo with her, and two thousand you get a photo, and then in some special super private room with the, only the people who gave this much money. So it was, if you think about, they sent that email to maybe you know a thousand people, of which maybe a hundred of them were actually rich enough or desperate enough to go do that. But what were they communicating to the other 900 of us? You know, what, what do they think the impact <laughs> is of that? That it's it's publicizing exactly what the Democratic Party's detractors say about it. That here is a pay-to-play, corrupt, elitist, rich person's party. And once you start thinking about them that way and you start looking at – you know, Hillary Clinton's policies or the Democratic Party's policies as promoting this, you know, neoliberal global corporate order, you can get pretty cynical about it. Um, not that you would go, you know, not that you would go as far as Trump, because I mean, what what he's doing, it's even more cynical. He's going to get government out of the way so that corporations can fleece uh, poor Americans in an even less hindered way. You know, if you've got no protection agencies, then companies can just 
can go for it. You know, just treat America or Americans like little developing third world people and and, you know, the the country into some kind of a banana republic. So it's uh it's odd. The the part I mean, the part that I think relates most to to, you know, my graphic novel and to uh, a cult culture is the Trumpian assertion that we can stop looking at facts, that facts don't matter as much as hopes and dreams, that what you want, what we will, so to speak, is more important than what is. So they can say, no, there were not just, you know, uh, 100,000 people or 50,000 people at our inauguration. There were 2.5 million people there. There were 2.5 million people there, period. It's almost as if what Trump is saying is that the reason he hates the media is because they won't do what is necessary to psych America into the positivist sort of dream state that is necessary for us to be truly happy or truly on top you know that it's a that it's that it's an act of will um is really it's really interesting <laughs> you know and i don't i'm not talking about it cynically or angrily i'm 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 looking at it as if it's not just some kind of angry public relations subterfuge but a almost a, a religious view and i think it's part of why he was able to get the uh whatever they're called now not the moral majority but the uh you know the christian fundamentalist the, why he was able to get those people because they're also the faith based community mm -hmm. really wants faith to trump fact and as if facts are these things, these persnickety numbers and metrics that are going to keep us grounded in in reality as we know it. But if we just – just like the secret, you know, just start talking as if you're the thing you want to be and eventually reality will catch up with – with your self-image, you know, so I, I mean, I wish they would come clean about it to say that's what we're doing. But I guess the minute you say that's what you're doing is the minute you're admitting that it's not that it's not real on some level. What's the media's role in this then? You know, as a media critic, as a media theorist. So what's their role in this now? Well, who's the media? You know, what's everyone's role? I used to believe that uh, the Internet was going to level the playing fields and let you know, whatever the best or most important content is, just rise to the top naturally. You know, that the gatekeepers were going to be removed. What we didn't realize was that as corporations built these social media platforms, that a different sort of filter would come into effect. So, no, there's no editor at a newspaper preventing all these memes and lies and ideas from spreading on Facebook and Twitter and Reddit and other social media, but there are other biases at play. You know, these platforms make money through clicks. The more people click, the more people spread, the more people share, the more money these platforms make. So the platforms themselves end up biased toward the most sensationalist, the most outrageous, the wildest kinds of stuff. That ends up getting, you know, tweeted and retweeted, whether it's by people who agree or disagree. So we end up in a media space that's just as challenged as the one that was run by William Randolph Hearst or 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 Rupert Murdoch, you know, in the last century. Only now it's got this tiny hole. The only things that get through are the things that are going to lead to these massive, impulsive uh, responses from the audience. So, you know, what's the media's job? I think the media's job is human intervention. You know, the media's job is to help people understand that these platforms are not a a window to reality, but these platforms are a very distorted picture of the most violent, outrageous stuff, that these are Charlie Sheen and Paris Hilton and Donald Trump that he's from that lineage of social media reality reality television outrageous hero that was built by the profit models of 
a new media landscape. And if you want a, you know, a world that in which you can, uh, you know, live and negotiate and think, um, you're going to have to get your media, choose your media differently. Hey, yo, real quick, I'm just cutting in here via post-production. Our Skype call dropped out at this point, and it took several minutes to iron things out, so Douglas and I decided to just press forward with our conversation. My apologies for the lack of follow-up on the previous points, but we were very short on time. So anyways, let's get back to it. Let's transition back into the book then. I love talking to people who write fiction because I'm interested in idea generation you said that you had conceived this idea about eight years ago. Let's go back to that point. How did the idea for Alistair versus Adolf come to be? It actually came up when uh, I was writing. Um, I was writing this comic book series called Testament, which looked at really looked at the magical origins of the Bible, and then translated them to a, a very near future dystopia. And while I was doing that, one of the editors at DC Comics, who was the publisher, um, <clears throat> they said, just beware, you know, we have a rule that you can't show a, uh, you can't show Jesus and a superhero in the same panel. Like there's some rule against that. And I was like, wow, that's weird. Or Jesus and a supervillain for that matter. Hmm. And I just thought, well, that's so weird. And then I started to think of other combinations, like just what would the weirdest, you know, the weirdest combination of kind of superhero with supervillain be to put in a panel together, you know, whether, you know, like, a, you know, Krishna and the Hulk or whatever. And then I thought of uh, Stern Adolf. And at the time, I didn't even know if they were... Um, I knew some about uh, about Crowley, but less his, his biography. And I was just thinking, well, were they even alive at exactly the same time? Crowley must have been old by then. And I started to look, and I saw that, yeah, that not only was was were they alive at the same time, but that Crowley had met Hitler a number of times and was really fascinated by him because he was so evil and believed in magic and all. So I came up with a you know kind of a fictional idea about a uh, a young army lieutenant who is charged with getting uh, with enlisting Aleister Crowley in the occult war against Adolf Hitler in World War II. And then as I researched it, I found out that this actually happened, you know, that there wasn't a young it, there wasn't a young uh, uh, army guy who did this, but that Crowley was deeply involved in the propaganda effort against Hitler and even so, went so far as um, supplying Hitler with falsified star charts so that he would make his uh, military maneuvers at inopportune moments that the allies would know about. And uh, it just seemed too rich to pass up, you know, so I did it. And it's a uh, I guess it's a fictional account of an of a set of nonfictional facts. So in, in a way, it's written more like a, a Shakespeare play where you take the uh, the historical events that we know about that, you know, that Hitler supplied Winston Churchill with the vias for victory sign and that he did it through Ian Fleming, who was the writer of the James Bond stories and, you know, that he was involved in an interrogation of Rudolf Hess and um, helped them get the spear of destiny back and had all these, you know, that there were a lot of facts. And then I just I kind of wove them together into a single story really about the difference between uh, white magic and black magic or or, you know, Crowley's more ceremonial expressions of will or or celebrations of will and uh hitler's more black magic you know sacrifice of millions of people to charge the swastika and that was really the the basis of the comic it's how do you reconcile these two forms of magic and which if either um which has been passed down to us which has ended up uh informing the way that we do public relations and branding and magic today yeah, you know, it seems like there's a very magical quality to the convergence now of technology and society with, and culture, which you have an interest in. What did you learn about the history of propaganda then while you were researching this? Well, I mean, most propaganda really did start around around wars and the needs of war. I mean, you know, Crowley was, it turns out Crowley was very involved in World War One, even more than World War Two. He, you know, lived in America and he was a double agent and he pretended to be a propagandist for the Germans when he was actually a propagandist for 
uh, America and England, and you know, so he w- he was deeply involved in that. But um, you know, what I learned in, in terms of the history of propaganda is that you know, propaganda was 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 largely invented uh, to get America into World War One. That Woodrow Wilson, uh, when he ran for president, ran on a peace platform. And everyone voted for him. He said he's going to keep us out of the war. And then he realized, oh, we've got to get into this war. It's really important. So he hired public relations specialists, the first ones, this guy, uh, you know, Walter Lippmann. And he created something called the Creel Commission. And the point of the Creel Commission was to get Americans to support our entering World War One, And that was really the, the beginnings of public relations. And that ended up trickling into advertising and regular public relations later. And after the war, it was the corporations. It was General Motors and Ford and General Electric and, uh, you know, ultimately McDonald's and all who who hired those people and, and used those techniques on on us, not to get us to support war, but to get us to support their products or to see their um, to see their brands the way we used to see the American flag or Christianity or uh, the other central totems in our in our lives. So yeah, it was a. Uh, it made me. I guess it made me realize that propaganda was so much less this kind of creative. Uh, the way they sell it in an advertising agency that, oh, here's our creative department and they're going to think of this great new brand mythology. But to realize that these really are the descendants of psyops, of psychological operations against a population. And then you, st- I start to look at advertising and branding as much more psychologically violent, really, than, than I looked at it before. Yeah. And, you know, there's a great line in the book where I think it's Crowley where you have him say, you know, a war of propaganda beats a real war, doesn't it? Right. Well, I mean, Crowley in this, he's very much the good guy. You know, I'm trying to argue that you don't have to charge magic with violence. There's a lot of ways to charge a sigil and it doesn't necessarily involve burning millions of people. And the the young character in this the, the real lead in this who's trying to reconcile these these two kinds of magic he has real trouble with that because um uh, in a lot of ways hitler was winning you know and hitler why uh you know why do this with gloves on why i feel like the the protagonist in this is is looking at you know hitler's magic is so much more potent because he's really doing it he's not depending on mind games and uh, and you know, willful self-control and meditation and yoga—it's uh, it's much more uh, it's much more overt. So uh, you know, I'm kind of looking at uh, looking at how do you balance those two uh, you know those two approaches. Definitely. Could we talk a little bit about the sphere of destiny then? Because you know, I think when you when you start to research or go down like the occult rabbit hole, the whole Nazi occult connection is something that you encounter right away. Uh, did you find any credence to this, to the Nazi occult connection, and then also to this Spear of Destiny story? Yeah, I mean, it's all true. You know, it's all true. It's just the thing I'm most proud of in this graphic novel is that it all has, you know, what we would call verisimilitude. The whole book is is real. I'm not saying it's it's factual. It's all necessarily factually historical, but there's nothing supernatural that happens in this book. What I'm doing is exploring magic as something real rather than something, you know, weird and super dimensional, you know, that it is a matter of will and convincing people and mind over matter. It's not a matter of levitation. Or you know, bringing ghosts and spirits into the this realm, or or seeing strange things. It's a matter of actually um, getting the results you want in this reality. So absolutely, I mean, I mean, you can watch History Channel at this point. It's like the Nazi Channel, you know. <laughs> but you watch it <laughs> yeah. any day of the week, and there's more occult secrets of the Nazis. And that is not to say that these things worked on a supernatural occult level, but they were practiced. They were believed. So if Adolf Hitler believes that the spear of destiny that he managed to steal, if he believes that that was the sword that killed Christ on the cross, and if he believes he is invincible as long as he has that spear, and if he behaves differently around people around him, if he develops more charisma because of that belief set, then it may as well be magic. 
you know, that is magic. It becomes a totem. It becomes a charged sigil that changes the way he and people around him act and changes what they believe, changes the the force and the confidence with which troops go on the battlefield, with which planners uh, arrange their their movements of troops. So, yeah, it's it's real. But yeah, the Nazis were were, you know, neck deep in this stuff to the point where the British were able to manipulate the Nazis by manipulating their magic. You know, that's where it got really interesting that if Crowley could do something that psyched out the opponent or made them feel like they had lost the magical edge or as with the star charts, manipulate them with fake magic, with with you know fake maps to the the other uh, to the other realms, then they gain an advantage. You know, likewise, if Hitler's understanding or or Crowley's understanding, for that matter, of the human psyche, let them develop things like the the vias for victory sign which gets replicated and charged by the the newspaper media and Winston Churchill and a series of poems and incantations you know they published incantations in the british newspapers for the vias for victory uh, hand gesture but they didn't call them incantations they <laughs> didn't call them magic they're just you know poems to help build enthusiasm they're patriotic poems for the people of england so it's magic it's just stealth magic it just wasn't presented as magic so yeah you know when you look at the writings of of hitler or crowley when you look at the formation of the the witchcraft bureau in germany and the uh the way they dragged off all the opposing lodges you know the various secret societies that were all disbanded and thrown into the uh concentration camps except for the very specific ones that were you know supported by um you're looking at a war but you know what's the difference between a magical war and a political battle today or a brand war between two opposing two companies that are selling the same things you know these are all the same kinds of things you go to any corporation and you look at the way they try to psych their employees or the millions of dollars that they put into their logo and all of the supposed science that goes into the way that thing is structured or the the um, the way that that the jingles or slogans for companies are put together and the neurolinguistic programming that they're using or uh, or other framing that's um just a uh, it, it's just crowley-esque magic with a more you know scientific or pseudo psycho edge on it do you think that this is something that we wanted to learn after world war ii when we brought over all of those nazi scientists Maybe it's one of the things we wanted to learn. I think with the real scientists, we were thinking more in terms of, um, you know, all the nuclear capabilities and time travel and whatever else that they, you know, might have been working on over there. You know, this Heisenberg principle and and the the exploitation of the atom really seemed to be like the next big thing. You know, I think we thought we'd be living in even more of an atomic age than we are. You know, I don't think we realized at the time quite how difficult atomic energy and these things were to use. But I think we we saw in the atom, I think we saw other sort of Einstein possibilities or bending, you know, teletransportation and, you know, Philadelphia experiment like weirdness. I thought we thought we believed that there'd be other stuff that we got out of this more like you know spice in <laughs> in, in Duke or something right. um yeah we've certainly um wanted to bring over the social scientists too you know we had our own we had uh, gregory bateson and and margaret mead who were really our you know the sociologists looking at crowd control on a national scale and how that would work but i think for for the the our imports i feel like we were more interested in their um in their their science and their propaganda but we were concerned you know we wanted to see how do we prevent something like that from happening in america and we thought the way to prevent it was by continually giving people the illusion of choice and that's the consumer reality that we built in america that you have the freedom to go into the supermarket and pick whichever 
detergent solution that you want. You know, there's hundreds of detergents on the shelf, even though they're all made by the same two or three companies and they all do exactly the same thing. We have this illusion of choice. And we thought that that choice would prevent sort of that, you know, fascism thing from happening. But once consumer choice and political choice ended up really being equated as they were, you know, now we've got we we fell into the same into the same trap, you know, and many, many Americans. And I understand why the world is confusing. It's hard to take care of oneself. You know, we really do want someone to be in charge. We want a kind of a daddy to be in charge and a world where we can once again believe that anything is possible, that we can believe that it's just working out, that it's okay, where we can dispense with reality-based problems like climate change or something because, you know, let's just, you know, believe our way out of this. Like in a dream where you're fall off something and then you decide it's okay, I can fly, I can fly, and then you can, that maybe we can, you know, live in a world that feels like that too. Yeah, I could see that for sure. I want to talk about Crowley for a bit because he's a very, I think, misunderstood figure. During your research and your writing of this book, do you find any sort of credence to the fact that he was, quote unquote, the wickedest man in the world? Because as you said, you painted him as the the good guy in this war against Hitler, but you find some stuff about him and it, it, it makes you think that he was just an asshole. Well, yeah, but I mean, compared to Hitler, though, you can, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you can be a pretty bad asshole and still right. come off as the good guy. I guess um, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he was uh, uh, in a few what could be considered abusive relationships. You know, he he screwed people over. He left somebody on on Mount Everest. You know, he wasn't it wasn't a great camping partner. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't a no man left behind. Yeah. Uh, sort of explore. So no, he did things that weren't that certainly weren't good. I don't think he was the wickedest man in the world. I think that's more, you know, the way people look at uh Genesis Peorage or someone today that someone who's going to be playing with these really dark energies, somebody who's going to be going into these really bad trip terrain. Sure, they're going to they're going to have a uh a naughtiness and a badness. They're not going to be so responsible to their loved ones. But, I mean, gosh, look at Buddha. You know, Buddha, mm-hmm. he abandoned his wife and children to go do his spiritual quest. I mean, what's that? You know, I don't, you know, I don't know that he was, I don't know that he was the nicest guy either. And that in certain cultures, I think he could have gotten framed just as, uh, uh, just as negatively as, as, uh, Crowley or Krishna for that matter, having, you know, sex with 12 women at one time and keeping all this, uh, uh, you know, these sort of concubine types and the kinds of stuff he, uh, he did and preached. It's really, it's, really tricky to be a magical spiritual transcending being without violating a lot of the the social norms of the time that you live in but no i don't i don't think he was you know the wickedest man alive i think he was um very much trying to distinguish between black magic and white magic between you know productive and destructive activities I just think that he was, you know, he was so committed in some ways to his uh, personal growth or elevation and deeply involved in in drugs and altered states that I think it just made him, you know, less responsible maybe than he should have been. There's always going to be a a cult-like atmosphere around someone who's leading a secret society and seems to have, you know, some kinds of supernatural abilities or access to things that that we don't normally have access to. I mean, you look at any spiritual leader who's going and doing workshops at Esalen or Omega or the Open Center or one of these places, and they're they're screwing these – they're they're acolytes. <laughs> and, you right. know, it, they're all they, – it's really hard for humans not to uh, not to fall into that. But yeah, I don't try to uh, make excuses for him. You know, there's – you can see some of the uh, emotional damage he's leaving in his wake. Uh, even in the book that I wrote without getting – without going too far into it, you know, he, he – uh, these were not victimless escapades that he was involved in. But I don't think they came – 
from a, an essentially evil place. Well, do you find any sort of meaning to his belief system, you know, to his edict, uh, do what thou wilt, love is the law, you know, like all that? Yeah, I think almost all of it's beneficial. I mean, in some ways, I mean, I could say that Crowley is, is that's one of my main lineages. You know, I was a friend of uh, Timothy Leary for a long time and Robert Anton Wilson and both of them studied Crowley. Uh, Timothy used to say he was the uh, reincarnation of uh, Aleister Crowley, which was kind of funny since yeah. they were alive at the same time. You know, <laughs> Crowley, yeah. Yeah. he was like 18 years old by the time he died. But um, whatever. It was still sweet that he would think so. But yeah, what what they're they're arguing for is 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 the will is uh, yeah you you the will is absolutely something to nourish and to get in touch with it's not it's so tricky for people particularly in america we get superstitious with it really fast you know people read read the secret or think it be it know it you know one of these self-improvement power of positive thinking things and they think that what it is is Oh, so there's this magic that you get. If you can focus hard enough, you change the molecules out there in reality. But it's really not that. I think it's really being in touch with your will. What do you actually want? What do you really want? And then you know, once you have a, a, a real clarity, it becomes much easier to move forward toward that. You know, and and circumstances sometimes seems to seem to change by themselves, but they're not just changing by themselves. They're changing because your relationship to them is different. The way that you are navigating your your world is different. Uh, but there's there are definitely big, hard obstacles that are hard to will yourself right through. You know, <laughs> the, the poverty and violence and, you know, uh, if you're a Syrian refugee in a camp in, in Turkey or somewhere now, it's hard just to use will to change those circumstances. It's going to be a, a slow and incremental process. I mean, you could use your will to change your experience of those circumstances, but it would be a misunderstanding to think that that magic is magic. You know, it's not magic. It's it's something it's something else. But it's it's definitely it's definitely real. And for people to become more honest with themselves about what they want, it really does free them to engage more purposefully and effectively in the world. Well, that just makes me think of like, if you will something and I will something and our two wills contradict each other, where the hell are we getting then? Well, if you're willing something that contradicts with someone else's will, then one of you is stepping on the other's terrain. You know, that you're not really stating your your will appropriately. Mm. You know, yeah. it's like, oh, so there's one muffin on the table and you are willing to have that muffin and I am willing to have that muffin and one of us must win. Yeah, then you're screwed. Okay. But if you are willing for abundance, you know, that's very different than willing for the particular muffin. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so right. it's a way of understanding what you really want rather than the most superficial application of what you want. You know, in uh, your bio at the back of this graphic novel, it says that you write comics when you want to tell the truth or get serious about something. What truth specifically then is in this book that you wanted to communicate? That the internet, the the internet and the web and social media, all this interactive media that we spend so much time on is inhabited not just by people, but by the quasi-living sigils of corporate America, that the internet is a place where corporations finally get equal footing with us. You know, that this is not, the internet's not a safe place. The internet is a place where these forces are interacting with each other and with us. And some of these forces actually are, are 
it's like the it's as if the internet created a physical home. It almost gives bodies to corporations. We're on equal footing there. Here in the real world, we still have the advantage because we're organic. We exist here. Corporations don't exist. They're abstracted. They're sigils. But out in the internet, we are sigils as well. You know, out on the internet, Mm -hmm. once these things migrated from the real world out there, these weapons of war that became styles of communication or became corporate logos and sigils, once they migrated out there, we moved into a reality where anything can happen, where the sigil magic of people and corporations ends up mattering a whole lot more than it did in the pre-mediated landscape of you know of uh, that that we lived in and i think that the latest activity the stuff that's going on now with um you know the the alt right and and donald trump bears witness to that that's really that's the warning of this of this book come true well, you know, I was going to ask you about that earlier, but I, I sort of transitioned away from it. But since it, it came back up, what do you make of the Pepe the Frog meme and, and all this stuff that's associated with that, that this this group on 4chan and Reddit that, you know, kind of stakes claim to this meme as the reason that Trump was elected? Well, it's as good a reason as any. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, certainly part of it. I mean, what's definitely true is that the uh, alt right is much better at sigil magic than the alt left. You know, if you, uh, it's interesting the way we've staked this out, though. It's like the alt left and the progressives are in the fact based universe, and in some ways, that I mean, it's it's important because you know there's things like climate change and economics and people starving, and you know there's a lot of facts going on that we need to address. But it could end up also making their campaigns, their their propaganda, their, their their persuasive techniques, it could make them um, very mundane. You know, it it limits their spread in a certain way. Where the alt right, uh, partly because the alt right philosophy is more individualistic, and individualism is easier to reconcile with all of this will and do what thou wilt. You know, it feels like an individual thing. This is what I wilt. I'm going to sit alone and do my sigil and it's my personal thing. I feel like they've been certainly better at using magic, but it's also they're more they're more likely to use magic because the the sort of the magical worldview right now is more consonant with libertarianism or with Ayn Rand or you know this this idea of mind over matter and my will over over others will I'm going to win you know that sense of focus or understanding all this is a game that needs to be played rather than as something with the kind of the the life or death stakes of real people that you don't know in some other place. You know, it becomes this academic sport exercise thing. So, yeah, I do think Pepe was real. I think Pepe, it was a, gosh, that was pretty smart stuff. This is this is real magic. And they, they really put together something that I was alluding to back in like 1994. I wrote a book called Media Virus, Mm -hmm. which launched this whole, you know, viral media mimetic warfare thing that we're in now. And even then I was arguing that mimetics really is closer to magic than it is to science. And they're the ones who really put that together. They're the ones who saw, oh, memes are a form of magic. And that's the that's the best model we have for disseminating this stuff. How do we provoke a response from the whole cultural organism is what matters here. And, uh, you know, and they were able to kind of to pinpoint that and they understood, oh, it's it's not about facts and real news. It's about fake news. It's about imagery. You know, so you create an image of, you know, whatever Hillary Clinton having sex with an alien or whatever kind of thing they did. And that image itself is powerful. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. That's the way the Nazis used imagery. It's this, you know, expression of will and of that's that's sigil magic for you is, you know, playing with the with the imagery and archetypes in people's heads. Absolutely. What do you think Tim Leary would think of all this? Well, gosh, I mean, I think what he would say is, look, I was right back in the 70s and 80s when I said that computers were psychedelics. And America, the world, is now living in a psychedelic substrate known as the Internet. 
only because they have no ritualistic, psychedelic, or psychological experience, the world is having a bad trip. They don't know how to trip. They don't know how to live in a psychedelic space where anything you think ends up kind of happening. You know, anything you imagine, you are going to have to behold. Every single line of thought gets followed to the end that we were so that we're inexperienced as a culture. So I think what he would say is we need more tutelage. We need more psychedelic tutelage. We need uh, spiritual leaders or psychologists to walk us through what is it to live in this psychedelic space now so that we don't continue to skid off one side or the other. Well put, man. And I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to tell the listeners about Team Human and the mission that you're on with that podcast. I've listened to it since you started it last summer, I think, right? And yeah, I'm yeah. I'm very impressed by it. And that that doesn't mean anything because I'm I'm nobody, but I I oh, yeah. it's one of the must listen to podcasts for our day and age. So. Tell people what that's about, how it started, and what you're trying to do with it. I mean, Team Human is is most simply, it's just a sustained argument for human intervention in the machine. You know, that we're living increasingly automated, directed, digital, capitalist lives. We're living in a world that does not promote or celebrate human autonomy. If anything, our tools from, you know, Facebook and Twitter to iPhones and our credit cards are trying to uh, iron out the the quirky nooks and crannies that make us people. That's what predictive algorithms are for, to advertise a future to us before we've even lived it in order to make our behavior more predictable. If there's an 80% chance that you're going to go on a diet in two weeks, the Facebook wants their, that to get that chance up to 90% or 100% so they can go to their sponsors and say, we know um, this person's going to go on a diet advertised to him. So the possibilities, the range of possibilities of for human behavior end up being narrowed. We become more like machines as our machines become more like people. So what, what the show is is really bringing together people to help people understand that being a human being is a team sport. This is not something that you do alone, that, that what makes humans human is our social capacity. So I'm talking to different people who are doing different kinds of things in teams to make the world more human, whether it's Astra Taylor from the Debt Collective or Andy Bicklebaum from the Yes Men or, uh, oh gosh, so many different people who are really just looking at what does it mean to be human at this moment and how do we promote How do we promote the human agenda? And it's really – a lot of it's a reaction against a a digital culture that really hates people. Google's main objective now is to develop artificial intelligence. Google's being run by a guy, Ray Kurzweil. He's their chief scientist who believes that humans are fast-growing obsolete, that machines are better than people, and that the minute that machines – think that we hit the singularity, then people will only be important insofar as we can keep the computers on and that consciousness itself should be uploaded to the chip and then we evolve to the next level. And I think they're leaving a whole lot out. I think they want to evolve past humanity before they even understand what it is that we're capable of. And they got mad at me and they said, oh, Doug, you only say this because you're a human. And I realized, yeah, you know, but that's not hubris to say this because I'm a human. I, 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 I'm on team human. I am a human and I refuse to apologize for fighting for my species survival in the coming age, particularly when it's not some other species that I like better who's going to take over. It's chips that don't think and feel. They calculate. They're not alive. They have no consciousness. They never have. They never will. And if that's a weird, superstitious, spiritual belief, you know, then so be it. You know, I'm, I'm okay being guilty of that, of thinking that humans are special. Um, So, yeah, that's what that show is about. And it's, you know, it's a lot of it's about activism is what do we have to do to make this world more accommodating to human life? And that does involve addressing climate change and uh, political malfeasance and all the kinds of stuff that um, that's getting in the way of humans. 
Well, that's why I love the show. That's why I love you, man. You know, I I didn't know how to articulate all that. I've been talking about this for years. I'm not a big fan of technology, but I understand where it can be useful. But it seems that we're trying to optimize, and I think you've said this before, so I might be stealing your own words, but we seem to optimize humans for technology when we should be optimizing technology for humans. Mm, exactly. Kind of. All right, man. Well, hey, I know we have a hard stop here. So where can people keep up with you and your work? Um, Rushcuff.com. There's a, uh, I, I do a uh, newsletter very infrequently. I should do it more. I do it like once a month, maybe once every two months, um, where I kind of let people know what's going on. And you can sign up for that at Rushcuff.com. You can get to my uh, Team Human podcast. It's uh, teamhuman.fm if you want to find out about that. Or just go to Rushcuff.com and you can find everything else. Um, from there and check out the book it got sold out right away and of course it takes them forever to make more but uh, i think there's more coming really soon so um but pick up alistair and adolf it's it's quite a trip and it's a but it's a fun one i would agree and i think we should plug to your artist for this book because the art is to use a magical word it's pretty spellbinding yeah well that's mike omic i mean he's uh he's he did a book on the knights templar so yeah. he was already uh he was predisposed to uh, draw this world the way uh, the way it needed to be drawn. So yeah, I mean, we both intentionally cast this comic book as a sigil. You know, it really it's it's meant to operate on uh, all these different levels at the same time. So uh, yeah, it, the the visual impact is uh, is a whole lot of it. Doug will say thanks so much for the time. Sure. All right. Thank you. All right. There you have it. My thanks again to Douglas Rushkoff. Check him out at rushkoff.com, R-U-S-H-K-O-F-F.com. Give the Team Human podcast a listen. You won't regret it. And grab his book, Alistair and Adolf, on Amazon before it sells out again. All of those are linked in the show notes if you're interested. Honestly, this is quite the graphic novel Douglas has written here. And as he and I discussed, very pertinent to the times we live in. I don't have much more to add to this discussion other than be cautious of what you see and be careful with what you share. Symbols and ideas are powerful, and if they weren't, corporations wouldn't spend billions of dollars every year shoving their logos and marketing messages in your face. And trust me on this, I worked in the newspaper business, and my current day job is in marketing and advertising. I feel my soul getting slowly sucked out of me on a daily basis. I know how this shit works. You are being psychologically manipulated by companies wanting your money, by media wanting your attention, and by government wanting your consent. There absolutely is a war going on right now, unseen, and it's being waged against your mind, your heart, your spirit, your consciousness. And we can win it together, but you got to get your shit in order first. Anyway, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Drop the show a good rating on iTunes if the mood strikes you. Or email me at occulturepodcast at gmail.com with any and all feedback. I appreciate it. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority.
Please rewind this cassette.